morning's lesson is from the book of Exodus. Now, <clears throat> what had been going on is the children of Israel had been down in Egypt, and there they were slaves. They had to do all the hard work, and even though they were sort of protected from enemies outside and they had food to eat, they weren't free, and they had to do exactly what they were told. Well, finally, the Lord sent Moses to them, Moses to lead them out. And you might recall that there were, that Pharaoh didn't want them to go at first. And so plagues came upon the, the people there. And it was only with the last plague that they were finally allowed to go. And this occurred as they were marching out of Egypt. Now it was told the king of Egypt that the people had fled. And the heart of Pharaoh and of his servants was turned against the people. And they said, why have we done this? that we have let Israel go from serving us. So he made ready his chariot and took his people with him. Also, he took 600 choice chariots, all the chariots of Egypt, and captains over all of them. So the Egyptians pursued them, all the horses and chariots of Pharaoh, his horsemen and his army, and overtook them camping by the sea beside Pihilaroth before baal Zephon. And when Pharaoh drew near, the children of Israel lifted up their eyes, and behold, the Egyptians marched after them. So they were very afraid. And the children of Israel cried out to the Lord. And they said to Moses, Because there were no graves in Egypt, have you taken us away to die in the wilderness? Why have you so dealt with us to bring us up out of Egypt? Is this not the word which we told you in Egypt, saying, <clears throat> It would be better for us to have served the Egyptians than that we should die in the wilderness. And Moses said to the people, Do not be afraid. Stand still and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will accomplish for you today. For the Egyptians whom you've seen today, you shall see them again no more forever. The Lord will fight for you, and you shall hold your peace. Amen. <clears throat> Now you can imagine how scary it must have been for the children of Israel. <clears throat> Here they are, finally thinking, we're going to be free. Moses is leading us out of Egypt to, to a promised land, a land flowing with milk and honey. And as they journeyed out, what did they encounter? Well, the Red Sea. And there was no way across it. There was no way around it. And so they were sort of stuck there and, and trying to figure out what to do. And just then they turned around and what do they see? The whole Egyptian army coming after them. Now, the children of Israel, they had slaves. Were they soldiers? No. Did, did they have any weapons with them? Spears or anything? Nothing. And here was one of the mightiest armies on earth coming after them. And they knew they were going to be killed. That they, they couldn't survive. They couldn't protect themselves. And so what did they do? Typical fashion. They cry it out and say, why did you take us out of Egypt? It's better for us to stay there than we should die here. Now, it's understandable they felt that way. It's, it's something that actually we can sometimes feel too. You know, sometimes we can be in the kind of slavery that the children of Israel, I mean, they were physical slaves, but, but we can be slaves to evil, slaves to those feelings of, of wanting to be selfish all the time, only want what I want. Only want my piece of the pie to be bigger. Only want my way to go so that we play my game and not yours. Or whatever it happens to be. <clears throat> and it's real easy to fall into that. And think only of yourself. And then you're really a slave. You're a slave to evil. It controls you. But you know, the Lord does send Moses to you also. He has your parents teach you what you should be doing and what you shouldn't be doing. And that's like Moses saying, come, let's go. Let's go from this slavery of Egypt to the promised land. And so you can say, all right, I'm not going to be selfish anymore. I'm not going to just think of myself. I'm not going to you know, push my ideas and not listen to anybody else. And you say, this is great, and I'll do it. And that's like the children of Israel marching out of Egypt. But what happens? They encounter a problem, the Red Sea. And we encounter them too. Well, I'm not going to be selfish anymore, but, but boy, I sure want to. And that feeling doesn't suddenly go away. So 
it's like we're getting stopped at the Red Sea. And, and, and then it seems so much easier to go back to Egypt. Now, interestingly, what choices did the children of Israel have before them when they stood at the sea and they saw the army coming? Well, they could have run back to the Egyptian army and that may have resulted in disaster. They might have been killed. Or they could have tried to <clears throat> run into the sea, but they would have drowned. <clears throat> what did Moses tell them to do? He said, stand still and see the salvation of the Lord, which he shall do for you today. For the Egyptians whom you see today, you will see them again no more forever. What's the Lord saying? If when you're trying to be better, and you run into a problem like the Red Sea, and you want to go back to being selfish, just hold on a little bit longer. You can't fight the army, but the Lord can. <clears throat> and you know what happened in the story after that? It said Moses was told to raise his rod, and the wind came and parted the waters, and they were able to go over on the dry land. And then when the Egyptian army tried to follow after them, they got bogged down in the mud, in the riverbed, and the waters came crashing back and destroyed them. And what that means is that if when you're trying to be better, and it's a little bit hard, if you can hang on, no, I can do it just a bit longer, and listen to, to Moses, the Lord will take care of us. We just have to hold our peace. Don't do anything stupid. Don't do anything bad. Don't do anything crazy. Just try to hold on. The Lord can indeed come and save you. So this is a very powerful message of how we can grow in life, how we can become better people. It's not easy. It doesn't happen overnight. But the more we try to hold on and see the salvation of the Lord, the more he can work those wonders in our lives now and forevermore. Amen. Now there arose a new king over Egypt who did not know Joseph. And he said to his people, look, the people of the children of Israel are more and mightier than we. Come, let us deal shrewdly with them, lest they multiply and happen in the event of war, that they also join our enemies and fight against us, and so go up out of the land. Therefore they set taskmasters over them to afflict them with their burdens. And they built for Pharaoh supply cities, Pithom and Ramses. But the more they afflicted them, the more they multiplied and grew, and they were in the dread of the children of Israel. Further, from the heavenly doctrines of the new church, in the Arcana Celestia 663, which is explaining the words, and as they afflicted it, so it was multiplied. This signifies that truths grew according to infestations. Most spirits who come from the world and have lived the life of the Lord's commandments, before they can be uplifted into heaven and joined to societies there, are infested by evils and falsities pertaining to them, to the end that they may be removed. The infestations take place by their being immersed in their evils and falsities. And while they are in them, the spirits who are in like evils and falsities are present and labor by every means to lead them away from good and truth. But still, they are not so immersed in deeply in the evils and falsities that the influx from the angels from the Lord may not prevail, and the balance is maintained with exactness. When this is being done, not only are the truths and goods strengthened with them, but more are instilled. This being the result of every spiritual combat in which the combatant is victorious. It is common in such combats for the Lord to turn into good all the evils that the hell intends. Wherefore, it is not permitted them to bring forth more or other evils than can be turned into good that is suited to the person who is in combat. The reason of this originates in the fact but the Lord's kingdom is a kingdom of uses, and therefore nothing can be done there that is not a source of good. Amen. Blessed are they who hear the word of God and keep it. The Egyptians set taskmasters over the Israelites to afflict them with burdens. 
but the more they afflicted them, the more they multiplied and grew. Pharaoh had a legitimate concern. The descendants of Jacob, their slave labor, were dramatically increasing in numbers. In fact, they outnumbered the Egyptians. Now, what would happen if they rebelled? That would cause untold problems. Or what if, in time of war, they sided with the enemies of Egypt and destroyed the Egyptian army? But Pharaoh was torn. Although he feared their potential power, he desperately wanted them to stay as slaves, doing the work that no one else was going to do. So his goal was to control the population without destroying them. His solution? Afflict them. Put all sorts of burdens on them so they wouldn't have time to procreate and multiply. But as we know, the more they were afflicted, the more they multiplied and grew. Persecution often meets with failure. Oppression often produces revolution. During the Roman prosecution, persecutions, the Christians rapidly expanded their numbers in the ancient world. Similarly, during times of crisis or emergency, it seems like the best is often brought out in people. <laughs> Acts of heroic self-sacrifice occur in the field of battle or in times of crisis when Average people seem to rise above themselves to protect others. This says something about the human spirit and indicates something about the Lord's ability to bring good out of evil. For his providence is guiding all affairs of life and a cardinal, cardinal rule is that he will not allow anything to happen unless good can come and will come out of it. Not one bad thing from the spilling of milk at dinner time to the untimely and tragic death of a young person would ever happen unless the Lord foresaw the use that could come out, the good that could come out, the good that he would bring out. The powerful story of this is found in Joseph. He had ten older brothers who envied his dreams and hated him. They initiated him being sold as a slave into Egypt where he wound up in prison, falsely accused. And though, although he, had re he rose to become Pharaoh's assistant through his interpretation of dreams, he had seen a tremendous amount of grief in his short life. Then after Batman forced the brothers to come down to Egypt, and Joseph had the easy ability to destroy them, <clears throat> he told them, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good in order to bring it about as it is today, to save my people alive. Joseph could see the hand of providence in the hellish motivations and actions of his brothers, although they intended him no good whatsoever. The Lord used their impetus for evil to put Joseph in a place where he could save his family in times of famine, and the children of Israel resulted from that. Good was brought out of evil. A more confusing example of this, <coughs> at least on the surface, <coughs> is that of Dinah and Shechem. Dinah, the daughter of Jacob, apparently fell in love with Shechem, the prince of a wandering tribe. To marry her, he and his tribe agreed to be circumcised, and were told in the Bible that <coughs> when they were in pain, Simon and Levi, Dinah's brothers, each took his sword and came boldly upon the city and killed all the males. Quite a gruesome tale. And the story in the literal sense simply ends there. There's no moral toll. There's no punishment or consequences that come upon the brothers, although <coughs> they were spoken of badly at the end of their life. And it's difficult, if not impossible, to see any good that came out of this. It's only in the doctrines of the new church that the Lord's hand can be seen. For we're taught there that this tribe was so spiritually different, descended from the most ancients, that if they had been united in marriage with the Jews, their eternal welfare would have been jeopardized by allowing the brothers' hellish motives to murder them, <coughs> be directed towards this tribe. The Lord's protected their spiritual life forever, even though it resulted in their natural death. Good was brought out of evil, Good that certainly could not be seen with any human eyes. The Lord knows that this world is limited and 
human suffering is inevitable. Not only are the laws of nature hard and inflexible, but the presence of evil brings untold pain and grief to people. But the Lord's created a universe in which good can arise in spite of, and often by means, of problems and pain. His overruling providence does not take away the difficulties we experience, but limits the suffering. He ensures that something useful comes out of any pain we encounter. The Lord uses adversity in all its many forms to gradually lead our thoughts and affections to a heavenly place. Consider physical suffering. The Lord really doesn't want us to feel any physical pain, but with bodies designed to wear out and eventually die, it's sort of inevitable. <clears throat> what good comes from physical pain? Well, it doesn't look like much at first, but where there's pain, there's the opportunity to step back, to change our routines, to think, to reflect about the Lord's providence, his care for us, and gives us something else to do to change, a little bit at least, the direction of our lives. Perhaps this is what the psalmist meant when he said, before I was afflicted, I went astray, but now I keep your word. It's good for me that I have been afflicted, that I may learn your statutes. Of course, Lord would rather us learn his statutes and, and keep his ways without physical pain. But he will allow it for a greater good to occur. Consider the harm that we do to ourselves and others from selfishness. Thinking of our own desires, we ignore the feelings of others around us. When they complain because we've paid no attention to what they're saying or they're upset because we've treated them unfairly, evil has been permitted. Why did the Lord allow it? Why didn't he just step in there and stop us from doing it so that evil wouldn't have occurred? Because it's only when we vividly see the results of our evil choices that we're willing to admit something's wrong and are willing to change. <clears throat> We tend to assume that all is well with us and the world, well, at least with us, if not the world, and that we're convinced of that until we run into problems where we discover, well, people aren't very happy with us. They didn't like what we said or what we did. It's a learning experience for us. It's how good can come out of being. Spiritually, what's described in the stories of Joseph and the afflictions of the Israelites about under Pharaoh are descriptions of how the Lord does indeed bring good out of evil. The burdens of the Israelites and the suffering of Joseph are images of spiritual struggles we all encounter. As they experience pain, so we have our times of doubt, our times where we wrestle with what choices to make, how to become better people. We're inclined, we're tempted to be selfish, even though we know we should. And these inner wrestlings that occur when that happens, <clears throat> really fighting against ourselves, produce intense anguish and difficulty at times. They confuse, they depress us. They're really a taste of what hell is like. But the Lord never allows us to experience those things unless he can bring good out of our life by means of it. For if we overcome in them by holding on to what is good and true, our heavenly loves are strengthened and increased. And we're told that more goods and truths are added to our lives. We don't visibly see this. It's something that is happening within us that the Lord isn't taking care of. But that's what he brings out of all our temptations, all our spiritual struggles. So what then should be our attitude towards adversity, towards these temptations? If it's a means by which we grow and learn, should we welcome it? Well, only a masochist welcomes pain. In the Lord's Prayer, we plead, lead us not into temptation. There's no real glory in suffering. Although broken bones that have healed are stronger where the break is than before, nobody goes around breaking their bones to make them stronger. It's just not how we operate. <clears throat> good is brought out of evil, but good can grow in our hearts in many ways. Through temptations, it's only one thing. The Israelite population had grown significantly even before the burdens were put upon them. Pharaoh didn't have to do anything more to them. And remember that whenever the Lord permits evil, 
He doesn't will it to happen. He doesn't want it to happen. It's not his plan to ever punish us. And in a sense, he never really has to because we wind up doing it to ourselves whenever we engage in evils, whenever we confuse our minds with false ideas. It's his will that no pain, no evil ever come upon us. But it's only when a worse evil might happen in our lives that he will allow a lesser evil to avoid what's worse. So we find ourselves in problems, what should we do? <laughs> well, there's going to be the natural reaction of frustration, sadness, and even anger. And we'll have to patiently work through them, try to make the best possible choices we can, and withstanding the assaults of the hells, which want to make us to give up. But we can be assured that the Lord will not depart from us when we're in pain. As the psalmist said, God is our refuge <clears throat> and strength and a very present help in trouble. The Lord upholds all who fall and raises up all who are bowed down. While each problem we encounter is from hell, the Lord is holding our hands that we might endure and overcome, so that the more we're afflicted, the more the Lord causes our spirits to grow. What makes us hard to accept at times is often the good which comes out of it is not obvious to us. We don't know it, like the death of Shechem and his tribe did not seem to result in any obvious good on earth. <clears throat> so we're not going to see what the Lord is doing within our lives. For how do we measure spiritual growth? How do we tell if we're spiritually stronger today than we were yesterday? We can't. Much of what we experience here is merely the prelude and the preparation for what the Lord is going to develop in us in the next world forever. The good which the Lord brings out of all evil can only emerge slowly. When Pharaoh afflicted the Israelites and <coughs> more of them were born, well, it would have taken nine months at least to have seen the effects of that. The good didn't happen right away. And good doesn't grow up quickly in our lives. Consider also Joseph. Could he have seen the good that the Lord was attending when he was in the pit? when he was falsely accused and thrown into prison, when he was planning to rescue his younger brother from his family when they, the brothers first came down to Egypt? No, it was only towards the end of his life when his brothers came, for him, <clears throat> came to him fearing for their own lives that he could see that while they meant it for evil, the Lord meant it for good. But the Lord always works within the freedom, within the limits of our freedom. They'll not dramatically change who we are, what our feelings and thoughts are. We'd never tolerate that. Rather, he's gradually touching and gently bending our thoughts and feelings to make us better people, to give us new delights, to, to give us a sense of what is good better today than before. Not in ways that we could tangibly measure, but in ways that make us better people. And that isn't seen immediately. It's only seen over the course of, of years of a lifetime. <clears throat> and that's just the beginning, as we know, because when we enter the other world, that process of regeneration continues forever. And we're freed of a lot of people that we experience here. So this is a grand scheme that the Lord has made. To use everything in this world to help us develop spiritually. His providence is overall willing and permitting that love might grow even in the midst of pain. Problems are not from heaven, but heaven can come from problems. As the psalmist said, those who sow in tears shall reap in joy. He who continually goes forth weeping and bearing seeds for sowing shall doubtless come again with rejoicing, bringing his sheaves with him. This is the Lord's promise. Regardless of the difficulties we encounter in life, he is with us. He is guiding, he is caring. He is bringing good out of you. Ah.